Thank you all for being here. Good morning uh, to all of the, uh, the representatives who are here. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, uh, Leader Gazelka, uh, Speaker Hortman, and all of the rest of the reps who will get mentioned up in here, our commissioners who are here. Um, this is an exciting day, and, and I'll just uh, own this candidly. It'll be the first uh, bill that I get to sign as the, the 41st governor of Minnesota. Uh, it's doing the people's work. And I'd just like to take a couple minutes to talk about what ended up here. I know there was a, a, a somewhat of an informal lottery of what would be the first bill that ended up here, distracted driving, voting, uh, or this. Uh, and these two pieces of legislation today, while I think if you look from the outside and you weren't following this, may not seem like they would have been the high profile things that came here, but this is the hard work of governance. This is the stuff that impacts people's tax dollars in a fairly significant manner, and it impacts the experience they have with government and the expectations they have out of government. Whether it's the ability to walk in and get a driver's license in a timely manner, or whether it's to work collectively together to take care of a toxic landfill in Andover that impacts all of us, and with Representative Scott's voice continuing to tell us that we need to move on this, and if we move quickly, we can save money. Those are the types of things that we came to. So we're here today to sign two pieces of legislation. The first deals with the broader issue of MinLARS, driver's license, and IT in the state. And at this point in time, I, I want to give uh, thanks to everyone who worked on this, Senator Gazelka, but I want to uh, talk about our members of the Senate and the House who worked together on that oversight committee, who came in from day one as I became governor of Minnesota, uh, took over this issue, and I will lay claim to ownership over MinLARS and fixing that together for that experience of Minnesotans. But the representatives who sat on that, Representative Hornstein, Representative Torkelson, uh, Senator Dibble, and at the heart of that uh, was Senator Newman, who uh, asked us to take a hard look at how we were doing this asked us to go back and be and follow what we knew was going to come out of the legislative auditor's report to be transparent to provide project um, oversight and project management and to see if we could come together for a compromise that would say if i'm going to ask minnesotans to give more tax dollars how are we going to guarantee that they get a return on that and it improves the services that they've come to expect um, and we did that together. We put protocols in place. We changed the dynamics of how we work together on that. And I didn't ask these legislators to do this on blind faith. I asked them to hold all of us and myself accountable. And we came to some, uh, some hard numbers. So there's money in here to make sure we move forward on the implementation of real ID and the driver's licenses to help finish that project. There's money to let us do the next software update on the MinLARS system, moving us as we did here on February 10th from 22 workarounds for our deputy registers down to 13, adding services for uh, consumers. That project and that process will continue on with no break in service. We will then come back and evaluate the entire way that we are doing that system. We will have independent folks come in and look at it. We will sit down together as we have through this whole process looking at every single piece of information, bringing in the coders, bringing in the commissioner to explain to us how this works, and getting to the heart of how do we improve that service. And then this is something I know is hard to ask for, some of the back office staff that need to help us make this happen. Um, and what the senators asked me for was, when you're requesting this, we want a line-by-line -line detail of where every money's going, where all of the people are working, what is going to be accomplished by them, and who's going to be held accountable that they do it. That is fair. That is good governments. That's the Minnesota way, and that's what this bill does. So I'm proud to be uh, signing this in just a moment. And we coupled it with uh, some of these projects that got lost in the, uh, the megabus or whatever it was at the end of last <laughs> session um, that were really important. These are projects that matter to people. They're projects across this entire state. And while the Andover landfill kind of became uh, the poster child for this, uh, there were many of these other projects that mattered. And how we went about setting aside some differences on how these things should be funded, how we went forward both in the case of Andover, if we do it now, we save money, the price is only going to go up, and the risk to citizens in terms of contaminated water will continue to go up. That just makes good sense. And in this, we used it as an opportunity in a bipartisan way to do some technical fixes and corrections to the corridor of commerce. And I am just going to, in full disclosure, lay it out there as I told uh, Senator Senjum, thank God the Highway 14 piece is in there and it's fixed. As a member, <laughs> as a member of Congress from Southern District, um, but what we do know is 
all of these other fixes that in there are equally important what we're learning together. So I'm proud to be here today. I'm proud that the process worked. I can tell you this, that these final bills are a long ways from where the two sides came in to start with, is the way government's supposed to be. It was done respectfully, and Senator Gazelka and Speaker Hortman and myself uh, were very clear when we started this that we understood very clearly this was a real run, but one with some training wheels on it for what May 20th could end up looking like. And it was incredibly important to all of us that there was no confusion on what we were talking about. There was an openness to compromise and go back and forth that staff and members of the House and Senate were engaged as possible. We'll go back and do an after action report to see where we could do better. But I'm here to tell you that we came to a compromise that's in the best interest of Minnesota taxpayers and Minnesota citizens. We compromised and provided services across the, the breadth of the state, uh, and we did so in a manner that's befitting to bipartisan common decency and governance. And again, I always like to say you, you shouldn't really get patted on the back for doing the things that you're supposed to do. But if you watch what happens in D.C. right now, um, I'm pretty darn proud of what we did here. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, uh, someone that I have come to truly respect, someone who I know speaks with integrity and honesty uh, in the best interest of the citizens of Minnesota, Senator Paul Gazelka. So, Well, good morning. Uh, as we look to May, this is what I want it to look like. But you have uh, Democrats and Republicans, the governor, the speaker, myself, and, and leaders from both bodies, both sides of the aisle, are here saying we got it done, we got it done on time, and it's something that we all can be proud of. And this is that first step. Uh, this, the Minlars bill and the, def, the bonding bill that had projects from, from water to roads in it were very, very important to get done and get off the table. I appreciate that the governor engaged early, uh, said what he was willing to do, took responsibility, but frankly, we acknowledge that we all take responsibility here because it's in Minnesota's best interest. And so it was give and take. Uh, but having these two bills going forward as the first and second bill really is important for Minnesota. It shows that we can, as the only divided government uh, in the United States, actually function in a way that's good for Minnesota. So I, I too, am very proud of it, uh, have great, great working relationships with the governor and the speaker. That bodes really well for Minnesota. Speaker? Well, good morning. It certainly takes a village, and I would like to really thank the um, state representatives who led on this. Representative Mary Murphy, if you could join us up here. Uh, she's the chief author of the bonding uh, correction. We've been calling it in the Minnesota House of Representatives a correction because it was really an error that those important projects were put in jeopardy by being funded through the LCCMR funds, a source that was never intended to be a source for bonding. Um, we're really pleased that the governor has really stepped forward on the Minnesota uh, licensing project and taken full responsibility for doing what we need to do to get things right. And at the legislature, we're partnering with the governor on this. And I know uh, the Republican Senate in particular uh, has no desire to spend any more money on Minlars ever. But we do need the system to work for Minnesotans. And so to, in order to get that done, we had to uh, bundle some other things with it. And we had a couple of impasse moments, but we kept working in a respectful manner to get past those impasse moments. I'd also like to thank Representative Rick Hansen, who took the lead on the Minlars deficiency bill in the Minnesota House of Representatives, and making sure that when it first passed the Minnesota House, that it had funding for the deputy registrars, who have borne really a lot of the burden of this system not working well. And we look forward to working with the Minnesota Senate to eventually provide some funding for the deputy registrars to compensate them for the hassles that they've endured. So thank you to the whole team for working together to get this done. Good morning. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here uh, with us today. These mills will make great progress on issues that are facing Minnesota communities. I understand the frustrations Minnesotans are having with the current licensing system. And this bill will allow us to continue to work on the driver and vehicle services components of MINLARS to continue increased staffing at uh, driver and vehicle services to better serve Minnesotans and to evaluate the, process, the progress on system development. 
development. These funds ensure work on the system continues uh, while also exploring options for continued development. The second bill that the governor is signing today will fund critical environmental and infrastructure uh, projects around Minnesota. Every family we believe deserves to live in a community with safe drinking water, clean air, and a healthy environment. The second bill the governor is signing today will help to make that a reality for more Minnesotans. And I'm heartened by the bipartisan work uh, that went into passing this important legislation. As you know, the governor and I both come out of the legislative branch, and we understand the importance of working together across lines of difference to solve tough problems in Minnesota. We are committed to building on this momentum through the rest of the session, and we will continue to foster conversations, build counterintuitive coalitions, and get things done. And now this is really exciting. Um, uh, I get to now introduce uh, the governor to sign uh, his first two bills of his administration. So, Governor, have a seat and let's do this. You make me feel. I am watching. Thanks, behind you. That was the most there. Yes. Again, before we get started on questions, I'd like to, uh, to just take a moment too and to thank the staff from everyone involved on this that it takes. Senator Jasinski, good to see you. And uh, I feel personally responsible for those Faribault One plates. And I, <laughs> I need to put in my request for the Minnesota One plates now, you know, just kind of that, that gamesmanship that goes. But uh, appreciate your, uh, your joining us and your, your strong advocacy uh, for, for fixing this. And, and also the note that got brought up that I know we're all, all of us agree on at the end of the day, trying to do something to, uh, to correct the situation for our deputy registers, and your voice on that has been really gratefully appreciated. So um, with that, we'd be glad to answer any questions. How do you keep the momentum going? I think you build, success builds on success. And, and we said this early, and I'm, I appreciate all the people who went out and did the research and, and reminded us that this is the latest first bill signing since 1989, I think, than what I heard on the radio today. The speaker reminded me that this is the latest start we've ever had, and we did it during the longest government shutdown. Uh, those aren't excuses. They're just reasons of things that are out there. I think we do it by what we knew was going to be important in this process, developing trust, relationships, and friendships. And, and I will just highlight that I had not had the pleasure of, of meeting Senator Newman or spending time with him prior to this process. And it was really important of someone who had historical knowledge and institutional knowledge of this, someone who had, uh, obviously, as, as many of us did, frustrations with the system and some ideas about how to correct it. Uh, I think building on that momentum now is that we're able to pick up the phone talk about these differences, try and work them out. So we need to move on to some things now. There's other things setting out there that I think we can pass and move forward. I certainly don't want to tell the House and Senate how to do their business and the timing of that. That is for them to work their will. Um, but this is important for Minnesotans to, uh, to recognize this can be done. It can be done on tough things. It was done on a spending bill, not something symbolic. It was done on something that makes us do the hard look at spending taxpayer dollars. Um, so I'm just hopeful. I think that the tone that this took and the very deliberate and conscious effort that all of us put into it, knowing that we were setting the tone for future negotiations, this was going to be a test amongst all of us. If, if, if someone's word mattered, if the willingness to bend a little bit, 
uh, if the willingness to, to step off some really hard lines to help move this bill a little further, that happened amongst a lot of representatives up here over some pretty charged issues. So I'm hopeful. You mentioned Senator Newman. Could we bring him forward, Senator? I put you on the spot. You did. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. My question oh. is, so you get the first bill through hands-free could be coming to you. Does a low-key, kind of quiet senator end up being the more successful model up here after this? <laughs> like. what, an, what an unusual question. Uh, if, if you saw me outside of the Senate, maybe you'd feel differently. <laughs> but why are you finding the success and could hands free be the next thing? Well, uh, the bill uh, that uh, the governor and I just worked on was, was truly a collaborative effort. Uh, we were in a kind of a tough spot. Uh, we, we can't go back, and we didn't really want to go forward. So we had to work out our, our differences, and, I, and, uh, and we did that. Uh, and uh, the governor was very open to discussing this matter in a transparent manner, and I sincerely appreciate that because I didn't have that before, and I do now. And I think that we will build on that success. As to the hands-free bill, uh, I can only say that that is a bill that, in my estimation, uh, it's about time that we move forward because there are people dying as a result of utilizing their phones while they're driving. And I'm trying to stop that. And uh, I think the governor is going to help me with that. We're going to get this one. Yeah. Thank you, Thank Senator. You. Yes. Mr. Chair, do you know, or, or Governor uh, Walls, uh, when will the help be coming for the deputy registrars to compensate them? Because they were left out of this. Well, well deputy registrars. Yeah. Oh. But I can, I can. Sure, sure. But I'll take a shot at it. Yeah, no. Uh, deputy registrars, uh, reimbursement is something that is really, really important, and I see the deputy registrars as being different than all of the other end, un end users who are adversely affected by this Minlar situation. And there I'm talking about the salvage industry, the auto auction industry, the towing industry, the auto dealers. They're all different than the deputy registrars. They really were harmed by the actions of this, the Minnesota govern government. And so to that end, I will tell you that uh, in uh, less than an hour, uh, we will be hearing Senator Jasinski's uh, deputy registrar's uh, funding request in the Senate transportation bill. Uh, so stay tuned and, and we'll let you know what it looks like when we're done. But uh, we are uh, now going to address that issue separately from the uh, Minlar's issue. And then there, of course, a line item in our budget to do exactly that because we're in agreement. So. I, I think that's when we can get over the line. Governor, do you think uh, uh, that a resolution of Minlars is within reach with the state agencies and the outside contractors bringing that resolution, or do you see this uh, eventually going to a private vendor? Well, I don't want to pass judgment at this time because one of the portions of this bill that uh, that we worked on together with Senator Newman is, is to bring some independent eyes back in again, to bring the the disinfectant of sunlight in and, and to see. I think with the commissioners that we've been working on and more of the transparency, I do believe we're on the, the right path to doing this. I think it was my job to convince folks here that this tranche of, uh, of funding would move us towards another fix. And to be honest, we, we uh, compromised. I asked for a little more, which means that I'm only going to be able to get one software fix out instead of the two over the next few months that was planned. But that's okay because I think that was for me to say, I can prove to you that we can do another successful launch like we did with 1.15 on the 10th. And if we can do this again and string together some accountability and some consistency in the system, which I believe we're seeing, we will get there. But I don't want to pass judgment at this time yet that I've said I'm open to that independent eye, that independent look. This is, again, kind of the trial run for the broader approach that we're going to take to uh, IT in having that blue ribbon panel, having over the horizon uh, goals that we need to get to, prioritizing state uh, IT systems and doing it with best practices and a whole lot of trust being built up amongst the folks who are being asked to do this. So I think we're on the right path. I think there's going to be an assessment come before May 1st to decide what is the ultimate direction to go. There's an agreement, I think, with most of us that we are moving in a better direction. The bulk of the deputy registers believe we're getting some of those fixes moving in the right direction. This is meant to kind of be a test ground to show that continued progress of what they gave us. Um, but I think they did it the right way, and I agree with them on this. 
they certainly weren't going to give all the money until they prove that we've turned the corner and there's a different management style and there's a different way of going about this. But I'm, I'm confident we're moving in that direction. I just don't know the form at the end of the day that it'll take. But what we do all agree upon is in the very near future, customer service needs to be a top priority. There needs to be safety and security in the system and that Minnesotans can expect a high level of customer service when they go in to take care of these transactions. Governor, the Minlar saga was invoked many times during the debate over the cybersecurity bill, which uh, there's, there's broad disparate uh, bills that are out there, 1.5 million, 6.6 million. It's all federal funds. Um, are you worried that this money may be held up as was at one point the, the accusation was just being held up as a bargaining chip, although Senator Gazelka said no. This the is funding. both the House and the Senate keeping their promises. Where are you at on this? And will you the play hard in the, in the conference committee? Yeah. Well, again, um, we're getting along and in a good spot, and so I don't want to be the person that ruins the moment, but I am having a hard time, so I'll go ahead and do that. Um, <laughs> sorry. I know. No, and, and I agree, and I, I want to be very, that there, I think there are legitimate concerns, but again, we're the last state to do this. Election security truly matters. There's a lot of safeguards into this. I have made it clear that I think it should have gone, and I'll just be candid that it wasn't worked out. I felt pretty strongly about this, but this is part of compromise, that I respected the Senate's opinion to give a little more time on this, so I pulled that out of this negotiations, out of that respect. That's the way give and take goes, but I'd like to think that maybe this helps build some of that trust, and that's another piece of legislation that come, comes forward. I, I deeply am concerned when election integrity is ever threatened, that is a dagger to the heart of a democracy, and we need to ensure people that by 2020 comes along that we use all these resources, their federal resources, we get that right. And I, I just uh, am hopeful that we're close. I think it's, it's healthy dialogue that we push each other a little bit, and we too want election security, and that HAVA bill is in conference committee. And, and we did talk about that. Is that something we can get done right now? There's a number of bills that we talk about, but... The healthy pushing back and forth is, is good and genuine, and we respect each other in the process. And so uh, you should expect uh, election security to be high on our priority. Uh, I expect something to get done. And like I said, it's in conference committee. Governor, you, you said HAVA was pulled out of, the, uh, of this negotiation. What else was in this negotiation that did well, we, Yeah, we agreed on that. I think there were some changes in numbers. Different things got added about it. I think, again, uh, the healthy part of this was is that we floated different things as it should happen in a negotiation. They were respected and, and we came to an agreement on something that, that may be a showstopper for each of us. And, and then each of us had to give something and said, I'd like this to be a showstopper, but I'm not going to make it that. So let's move forward. So it was pretty much what you see at the end of the bill, the structure of, of how it was done, some of the requirements. Uh, the actual end number, especially on the, uh, the Minlar's piece of it, was a negotiating piece. But pretty much this was it. Um, but HAVA did get discussed as being part of this. It was our joint agreement that it would be better maybe to allow that to move by itself, get something done. And I think, as the senator said, we're getting close. When will the independent review start of That's Minlar? That's a good question. This might be one for Commissioner Floyd. So. Hi, Commissioner Poirier. I'm the acting commissioner for Minute. Uh, it has already begun. Actually, last Friday, uh, we had a three-person team that came in, including the uh, chairman of the new Blue Ribbon Council that uh, was uh, the governor's uh, second executive order. So uh, it's well on its way. It's going to continue in earnest, and we will hit the 1 May deadline or earlier to provide a comprehensive review of MEMNARS. Can you go over who's on this, who the three people are? Um, well, I'll just leave that to, uh, to the chairman uh, to explain at, at a later date. Uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, the chairman is Rick King. Uh, I can tell you uh, that there was two other members that he brought along that uh, we have not uh, finished the nomination process uh, for the Blue Ribbon Council yet. So I don't want to get ahead of anyone's headlights on that one. Uh, but. Uh, uh, one of them, I can tell you, is a, uh, a former CIO of two major airlines. So these are some really big hitters that are coming in 
uh, to do the evaluation it will be comprehensive and, uh, and we'll let the report speak for itself. But I'm sorry, you said they're already doing the work. Uh, we should, they're doing work for the state. We should know who they are. Um, so they aren't being paid to do this work for the state. They're, they've come in, you know, like a lot of people, like a lot of Minnesotans out there, come in, they offer their time uh, for that. Uh, the only person that I can talk about right now is Rick King because he is the chairman and he already has been named. Where's the $100,000 going to then if these two other people are not being paid? Um, it, it's only for expenses. They're not, they're, there's no you know, stipend that they're getting. We're not anything. certain it'll be huge. Right. But we put it in case to make sure that we get this right. And if I could, I'll, I'll fill in on this. Mm -hmm. We should be announcing, I would, I, I hopefully, if, if Chris is here this week, I think we're going to, we're very close on this blue ribbon panel. Uh, what we ask them to do is to come in and, and give first eye view what it's going to take and then for them to go back and decide what this review is going to look like. And that will all be made public. Uh, the appropriation that was put into this uh, was to ensure if we've got people driving. We, are, we just had this conversation beforehand. Uh, there's no certainty that we will we'll need to do that because I am doing the thing across the state. I'm asking, uh, ask not what Minnesota can do for you, ask what you can do for Minnesota. And people across the spectrum are rising up and volunteering to come in because they want this to work. They, they want this to work and it was our agreement together, all of us and Senator Newman talking about this, before we go forward and spend more money and determine what the end looks like, can we all just pause for a second, have those independent eyes in addition to the legislative order come in, have real experts take a look at this and, and validate that we are making the correct course of action decision and I, and I fully support that. that. That's exactly what we need. So we'll get to that I hopefully this week um, and he's right, uh, Chair King is starting to lead this, but it will involve um, a wide spectrum of, of, our, uh, of our business community and our tech community across the state. Governor, what about a permanent commissioner for IT? Where are you at on that? Are you getting closer? Yeah, Kathy Thunheim is leading up uh, the team on that. Uh, we hope to, uh, to be able to bring people in. And I want to make note of this. The folks that are working at Minute and the commissioner right now that I recognize, I put them in a very challenging situation where they are flying the plane at the same time um, I'm asking them who's going to be the pilot tomorrow or it might be. Uh, this is what public service looks like. This is stepping up because this is, uh, quite honestly, as many of you can understand, an uncomfortable situation for a lot of folks, but they're rising to the occasion. Our goal is hopefully to have something done in the next couple of weeks by the end of the month, get are someone. Coming forward they are. Candidates, you feel confident you'll find the right I think, person? yes, and we have folks working there right now that are coming forward, that they are coming out. I think it's getting those eyes from folks who have hired in major corporations of what you're looking for. Again, as I said yesterday, I've made this challenging because I am still at the time with my team writing the job description for this as we're trying to understand what Minute's role would be because we're re-looking at it in light of Minsure and Minlars. Uh, there are a lot of success stories, of course, that don't get told in our tech community, but there's a lot more going forward that's going to have to be there. So I'm asking to hire for something that up until, I would argue, almost now, we hadn't provided that job description in a really tight format. Now we're starting to get that, and that's why bringing people out. But there are people coming out. And Governor, we're correct to, to understand that there's no, you can't go buy a system like this on the shelf. There's, there's no <laughs> Minlars waiting to be purchased somewhere from another state. No, but it doesn't mean you can't buy the core components that we couldn't have done this. And this, this saga, if you will, uh, of Minlars that for some of you journalists, I think there's a book deal in here for you at some point to tell the whole story, dates clear back through three administrations now. Um, each side tries to use this and say, well, we had Hewlett Packard, so let's blame the private sector. And then we didn't have Hewlett Packard, let's blame the public sector. There's plenty of blame uh, to go around in this, but when you do these, and my, it so happens my congressional experience served me well here that I was the author and instrumental in having DOD, the Department of Defense, and the VA share the Cerner electronic record of what goes into that. And I have learned much on the electronic health record side because I think a lot of people think an electronic health record is just a spreadsheet. It is not a spreadsheet. It's a diagnostic tool that is ruled by laws and all kinds of things that go with it. The same thing is true of a driver's license system that we can't just use in other states because our rules are different on the driver's license, some of the things that were wrote, written into it. So you have to customize it. That doesn't mean a lot of times you buy the core component and then you buy or create the bolt-on components that go with it. Um, so it wasn't as easy as you should have just gone down to, you know, Office Depot and bought it off the shelf and we'd have saved $100 million. That's not true, that it's more complex. 
The question I do think, and we're going to ask this in technology in general, should we think about that when we do our regulating on how it's going to fit and how it's applicable to actual real-world applications? And I'm not asking legislators here to change a law to fit a software system exactly, but there might be a way before we do the law to say, well, how did they deal with this when they changed weight restrictions, you know, for licensing or whatever it might be? How did they do that in West Virginia? And was there a way that we could translate that? So yeah, that, that is fair to say. I'm not saying that these problems came because this is, you know, so complex a you know, landing a woman on Mars. It, it, it shouldn't be. But it is more complex than, you know, the analogies that, my God, it's just a driver's license. We were able to get them in 1940. How come we can't get them now? A um, little more complexity. And then the cybersecurity piece that got asked earlier, we're really concerned, too. Governor, we had Democrats bending over backwards on the Senate floor the other day to reassure the public that the minute is not involved in the cybersecurity initiative. <laughs> to what degree do you feel pressure to get this choice right? I feel a lot of pressure to get it right, as I do with all of these. I have been entrusted with the, the, uh, the responsibility by the citizens of Minnesota to exercise good judgment, use the facts, and then place people in positions of responsibility to get this right. And again, uh, I'm as frustrated as anybody else when it came to Minlars. It's, uh, it's a complex issue. Cybersecurity is something that I have dealt with um, in my time in Congress constantly. And the thing that's challenging about this was on the day we were getting ready to uh, launch 1.15, if some of you recall, were the two days that none of us could withdraw money from Wells Fargo with our ATM because the situation had gone down with them. A major global banking entity was having some of the issues and glitch problems that, uh, that go with this. So I think it's important to stay focused on the cybersecurity. I think it's prudent um, to be incredibly cautious and skeptical. And then that's what forces us to make sure that the protocols that are put in place are protecting data. Because again, when I point to the private sector having data breaches, that's not an excuse for the public sector to have them too. It's just a recognition that this is a challenge for all of us. And I think it makes sense here to not see ourselves, and that's what we're doing with this blue ribbon panel, not to see this as public private uh, at odds to one another, but seeing us of what can we learn from you and what can you learn from us to ensure security. Governor, a question for you, uh, the majority leader and the speaker. These weren't really the early wins you talked about. Um, what's the status on those? Is it too late to add those early wins? Yeah, well, I would just say you know, we're considering this good. This is government on. We're in session. We did the people's business. Uh, we got significant two significant pieces of legislation done today. Uh, I think the best laid plans of mice and men type of thing that I think many of us thought it might be the hands free. Um, we thought it might be HAVA, but situations change. So the one thing that I can say is the question that Mary asked earlier is how do we build on this momentum? It's that trust and commitment. I feel really good working with this group of people because there were significantly philosophical policy fiscal differences. Uh, there were folks here who had a lot longer history than I had with it. The, uh, the lieutenant governor worked on it in the House. There were all kinds of moving pieces on this, but at the end of the day, it came down to what's in the best interest of Minnesotans and how do we find that common ground. So I can't anticipate, the, I guess the House and Senate will know, but I think there'll be more of these. And, and I have to tell you, we are still under the expectation that we can get our work done on time serving Minnesotans, working together in divided government with a realization that there, there's a couple of choices here. If we choose not to compromise, we will go to special session. If we choose not to compromise there, we could go to a shutdown. That is a model that our folks in D.C. have shown us time and time again. Uh, I guess it works if that's your end. It doesn't work for us. So we're still hyper, at least I feel like we are, hyper cognizant of our responsibility to find a working deal. I think you have with the three of us the uh, measure twice, cut once philosophy and uh, three folks who are very pragmatic and willing to get along. Um, the relationship that Representative Hornstein and Senator Newman built working on the distracted driving, really moving a major proposal rapidly through January and February where we're pretty much ready to take that up on the House floor, um, served us well in this negotiation. So when we were trying to work out the finer points of Minlars, that they had that relationship and um, those conversations this weekend to get us to the point where we could um, 
have this bill signed into law today. There are a number of issues in the criminal justice uh, area that came out of Omnibus Prime. There are the elections issues uh, that came out of Omnibus Prime. So uh, the Senator and I have been meeting weekly and we have uh, uh, several bills that we'll be talking about uh, this week as we have been talking about every week that are teed up for immediate action. Understanding that there would be the full $6.6 .6 million in that HAVA bill. Let me answer the other question first. Uh, just so uh, I think this is important too because the process is, is frankly just slower than all of us want, but it's got to go through all the committees and uh, new legislators engage. Uh, but uh, Speaker Hartman mentioned that we meet weekly. I think that's important to know and talk about what are the things that we can move forward. Uh, I think hands free will get done soon. The definition of soon is a, a little bit broad, but that is one that won't, it won't be in the end. I think the opioid abuse bill is, is going to happen before the end. So there's just a number of bills that we want to happen, but we uh, respect that there are other legislators in the process uh, to get it over the finish line. What other negotiations are going on that we don't know anything about? <laughs> <laughs> Probably more than I don't know about. So. No, I mean, uh, you know, we talk about a lot of issues, especially the speaker and I, and then uh, the, the governor lays out the direction he wants to go, and we, we try to work with where we're going, but uh, you know, it really, it's every day. Right now, it's, it's the budget, is what we're all thinking about. How do we make that fit with the new numbers? And uh, we all know that uh, a downturn in that uh, makes it tougher, but because we're talking, uh, that means I'm, I'm still confident we're gonna figure out how to get it done. So you I can have... assure you that we have been talking about HAVA for 60 days. And you could see the moment of frustration on my part when uh, Senator Gazelka got a letter from me on Valentine's Day, and it wasn't a Valentine, it was about Hava. Um, but that was good, right? We dialed up the conflict, I got his letter um, back, and now we have a bill that's going to conference. So I think we probably need to have a little bit more conflict before we have more resolution. Um, the other thing that there's been a lot of conversation about behind the scenes and in public is distracted driving and the opioid abuse scandal. I think we're seeing really incredible work by representatives Dave Baker and Liz Olson and Senators Chris Eaton and Julie Rosen. So those are things that you know you, you kind of know are going on, but there's conversations offline and in committee. And you've seen the opioid bill moving through both bodies with a considerable amount of debate. Was it nursing homes kind of in that bucket of yeah, only things expected? Is that being offline? Representative uh, Jennifer Schultz and uh, Senator Karen Housley have been working very well together. Uh, Senator Housley had a, a family uh, loss, and so that did slow things down a little bit, but they've been working very, very well together. We have time for one more question. Have you guys actually started talking about taxes, gas tax, big? I sure have. <laughs> <laughs> So. <laughs> Maybe you can help me. I'm trying to persuade so. Senator, Senator Gazelka that we should have some public meetings that we compare the House and Senate targets. Uh, the House will uh, reach their targets on March 25th. The Senate will achieve their targets on March 30th. I think we would all benefit from a public conversation comparing the two. Those are the positions that we'll be bringing into conference and that will be the starting point. And uh, I think the administration's participation in public discussions about our three sets of targets would benefit all of us. And those discussions, I think, should happen the first two weeks in April in a public forum, like the Legislative Coordinating Commission or the Legislative Commission on Planning and Fiscal Policy. Yeah. But I'm asking about private conversations. Have you actually talked about it? We yeah. have. Yeah, I tell him that he needs to lower his expectations. <laughs> well, everything, here's what I would say. <laughs> everything is, uh, is relative, and I just saw Michigan's gas tax proposal today, so I am way, way under where they're at, and so uh, we'll get there. But no, these conversations are happening. Um, we're broaching the, the big subjects, healthcare, reinsurance, uh, uh, premium supports, different types of ways to do that, and it's about easing in. And I, I would just have to say, never having been governor and lieutenant governor before, uh, our expectation was this is how governance should work, the, the show of respect, uh, the give and take that's here, and the one thing that I think should be so encouraging to the citizens of Minnesota, 
that these debates are not on ideological lines. They're simply along lines that they feel is best for Minnesota citizens. Now, those may come back to our own personal ideology, but they're not framed up that way. We think this is best for Minnesota. That's why we're advocating for it, and everybody involved is doing that. So this is a good win today. I want to thank you for coming. I'm very proud that these are the first two pieces of legislation um, that this administration, the Walls Flanagan administration, signed into law, and Minnesotans should know that it was done in a bipartisan manner that uh, that honors that tradition of the state that works. So thank you all. Folks, if anyone wants to grab a photo of the legislation, leave it on the desk here. Thank you, Governor. Yeah, thank you.